So this is going to be the final part of the Germany series that I'm doing. It's the second part um, of topic three, which is the Nazi regime. So in the last video, we covered um, the first half, which basically focuses on Nazi methods of control. As I mentioned in that first video as well, although the content of the second part differs somewhat and focuses more on what life was like for various different groups in Germany, um, the content covered in this part of the topic can also be used to answer question, the main type of question from the previous part of the topic, which is how the Nazis kept control. So if you were to get a question about propaganda, say, or terror or whatnot, you can talk about as counter arguments, um, the, is the issues we'll discuss in this video. You can also be asked about the specific points themselves. So the two do interlink and is a synoptic um, topic, as I mentioned in that previous video. So um, last, last video, I talked about the methods of control as well as the extent of opposition. This next other topic looks at impact of Nazi rule on different groups in Germany, so women, youth, and basically their economic policy, so that includes um, workers, regular workers, farmers, etc. And then also focuses on minorities. Um, and then lastly, there's this bit at the end of the topic which looks at the impact of the Second World War, which increasingly um, has been getting more attention in terms of exam questions. Having said that, I think it's a more difficult part of the course to answer questions about, so I'll talk more about what you do if those came up a little bit later on when I cover that part of it. So, um, as I said, the bulk of this topic is basically looking at um, what life was like in Germany for various different groups of people. So that basically includes the following things. Looking at how the Nazis changed the lives of children, women and workers. Um, you also have to know about the reasons why they adopted policies towards these various different groups. So you can get four markers about what kind of the policies were adopted. You can get six mark questions about why they adopted those or why that particular group method or something along those lines. You can also get specific 10 mark questions for any of these groups about the extent to which the Nazis had success in their policies towards them. So I'll, I'll go over how you would potentially answer that for each of these groups effectively. Um, and as I mentioned beforehand, you can also get questions about the extent to which the Nazis were supported by these groups as well. Um, so yeah, quite a wide range of things which you could potentially get in relation to these to, in relation to this other topic. Um, so we'll just crack on and dive straight into the impact that it had on various different groups, starting with women. Um, so, Nazi policy towards women, or Nazi policies towards women, are fairly straightforward. The Nazis basically believed that women should adopt very traditional roles, essentially being a mother and or a housewife. Well, basically both of those two things. Um, this does not, however, mean that in the Nazi plan, women were unimportant. To the contrary, um, Hitler considered women to be essential to his grand plan, and really all the groups we're going to talk about, Hitler considers to be essential in some, in some form or another, but women obviously are particularly important, and we'll kind of go over why in, in a moment. Um, so yeah, their aims for women basically were in conjunction with his broader aims for Germany. So to break down the previous point about the traditional roles, there's three main things which the Nazis want women to do. The first thing is um, the Nazis want women to be staying at home instead of going out to work. So I mentioned in the very first video where we looked at Weimar Germany, that women had increasingly been going out to work in some quite high power professions as well, and that Germany was quite a modern liberal state in some ways. Um, that was going to come to an end under the Nazis. So they obviously, if you want women to stay at home to look after their families, um, they have to basically not be in work. Secondly, um, the Nazis felt women had to stay at home to help ensure that they did not take work from men, from men who they believe should be the main providers. That's number one. Number two, um, the Nazis had some very strict and particular views about the appearance and health of women. So for the Nazis, women had to look natural, or adopt natural looks. Um, so that meant not wearing makeup and, you know, not putting doing their hair in unnatural styles or you know using yeah essentially various modern styles instead they should wear very simple clothes have very simple hairstyles you know hair tied in a bun behind their um head things like that um as well as also just being very modest in their dress um, so again very simple traditional clothing um you know basic dresses etc um linked to that as well women also had to be quite physically healthy that's obviously to help ensure that they can basically raise children. A, to actually have children. Childbearing is quite difficult. So the more physically strong a woman was, the more she would therefore be able to bear children and then raise them afterwards. Um, lastly, again, these three things all interlink, is that women should all get married and have as many children as possible. And the very simple reason behind this is Hitler, um, as we've mentioned a few times already, wants to expand Germany. He wants to create as many soldiers as he can, first of all, to go and fight in the army and help take over um, lands across Europe as well as also creating people to work in the factories, as well as people to go and settle in those um, new conquered territories and colonies. Um, so it was essential for women to have as many children as possible, that is, real German Aryan women, um, so that they can, you know, breed as many of them as possible. 
So how do they go about doing this? Um, so the Nazis have a, a range of policies, some that are particularly famous. Um, the main policy was this first one here, which is the law for the, encour the encouragement of marriage, which was passed almost immediately in 1933. So this basically has two parts. So the first part is, is that young couples who got married would be given a loan of 1,000 marks, but only if a woman stopped working. So A, encourages marriage, but also B, at the same time, um, incentivizes women to give up their roles and their jobs and basically become housewives instead. But then uh, to incentivize the childbearing part of it, um, every single child that the couple would have would lead to one quarter of their loan being written off. So in theory, if a, if a couple had four children, they would basically have the entire loan scrapped. And so it's essentially a thousand marks just given to them as a grant. Um, secondly, divorce laws were then changed. So again, this is to help ensure that women had children. So um, a man was allowed to get a divorce if a woman could not um, physically, that is, or did not want to have any children. So again, it's further encouraging people to have children. Um, this is more of a incentive for women as opposed to men. Um, a award created called the Mother's Cross was created, which you may be aware of. It's one of the more bizarre parts of Nazi policies in the 30s, um, where women would basically get given medals for having children. Um, there's various different ranks of it, but if you had eight children, you'd be given a gold medal. Um, this basically means that women get given quite a lot of status in society if they've got if they've got children. Um, and in particular, let's say, for example, if a woman was cross, crossing the road, or within, if, a, if a woman went past Hitler Youth members, members of the Hitler Youth were obliged to stop and give salutes to women who were wearing those medals. So again, they put quite a lot of effort, quite a lot of effort into making um, the role of mother and a housewife quite a prestigious and respected um, position within society. Um, the other really quite famous not not as effective in reality um didn't actually have that many people who took up the offer um, but the other kind of famous method or, or um policy of the nazis camp was, was a policy called the liebensborn program where essentially if you were a young single woman aryan of course that is um there were these essentially centers where you would go and there would be ss soldiers who would impregnate the women um and again the idea is that if an aryan woman would go there the ss of course had to be of aryan stock and so this would basically help ensure or help to create um, a large number of genetically pure um, Aryan Germans. Quite a controversial policy, but again, it's in line with the same point where the, the goal here ultimately is to breed children. So this, of course, um, the woman, you know, is not married here, but the key point is you're breeding Aryan children. That's the ultimate priority here. Um, the Nazis also took a few quite crucial steps to try and stop women from going into jobs. So I mentioned how with the, with the law for the encouragement of, of marriage, that women would be incentivized to quit the jobs in that way. But there are also a few other ways that it happened. So the first obvious way was to, just, just through basic propaganda. So I mentioned in the last video how that was obviously all over the place in Germany. So um, Nazi propaganda posters, films, etc., constantly showed women as wives and mothers and portrayed them in a glorified way. So again, they were constantly being kind of shown these images that portrayed motherhood in a very positive light and again, in a very prestigious prestigious light and prestigious role um in terms of so that's the, the sort of the carrot side of things in terms of the stick side of things so force um from 1933 women were banned from working as doctors and civil servants and also banned from being judges and lawyers um by 1936 so some of those roles which I mentioned in the very first video that women had increasingly been finding their way making their ways into um they then get banned from so essentially if you're going to be working it's going to be in a very menial job which you're unlikely to want in the first place. So the kinds of roles where you may want to do instead of, say, being a housewife, um, you're not allowed to do any more anyway. So it's again, it's just sort of rolling back the incentives for women to be going to the workplace. We'll mention this when we look at Hitler Youth and, edu and, and young people, um, but also within the school system, um, girls' schools focused entirely on teaching girls home skills and basic domestic sciences and things like that, not skills that prepare them for the workplace. So lower down the pecking order in terms of lower down the age group, they're also kind of encouraging girls that way. Um, and then lastly, schools that were preparing girls for university, um, e.g. grammar schools, um, were banned in 1937. So again, kind of any route for a woman to potentially go into um, a proper career profession was just sort of being taken away slowly by the Nazis. So between all these different policies, you've got a massive concerted effort to try and get women out of the workplace and instead into marriages and into the home and having as many children as possible. So, like like everything which we're going to look at for this video, there are successes for the Nazis in terms of how well this works, and there are also some clear there's some clear evidence of failure. So, um, in terms of getting women out of out of jobs, 
Um, 360,000 women give up their jobs by 1934. And you also have a massive drop in the number of girls who are attending university. So that drops from 17,000 from 17, in 1932 to just 6,000 in 1939. Um, this next point, if you if you were to get a question about, again, the extent of success, I would make this point in it. Although it's a tenuous link, you can still make the argument. So the fact that unemployment amongst men, um, amongst German men falls significantly, um, and also the fact that marriage increases and the birth rate also increases, these are all individual points which you can argue um, are proof or evidence that Nazi policies towards women have been working. We can't prove the link directly, but you can still make the argument in an assessment. Um, so yeah, you can make that, that particular point so that in terms of the stats of how German unemployment falls and also the fact that the birth rate increases by 33% in this time period. It obviously has some kind of a link. Um, however, the counter arguments here, um, some women obviously disliked Nazi ideas and felt that those ideas degraded them. Um, however, it's difficult to gauge just how much or just how much of a feeling, just how much that thing did exist, given that there were a lack of organized resistance or groups and resistance to the Nazis, as I mentioned in the last video. Um, but then also, um, Nazi policies were undermined by other Nazi policies. So although on the one hand, you could argue there was some success, the Nazis themselves had to roll back some of those policies um, due to later, due to changes in the latter part of the decade. So when rearmament happens, um, it basically means that the Nazis have to massively ramp up production in the factories, get more workers in there as much as they can. And as a consequence, it means that they actually even have to start getting women back into the workplace as a result, because it ramps up, or the rearmament is so extensive by the late, by the late 1930s. Um, so by 1939, so just before the war bro breaks out, you have 7 million women in work compared to 5 million in 1933. So they've actually, there's actually more women in work compared to before the Nazis took power because they're having to put them in there. So the Nazis themselves end up undermining their own policies. So clearly it's not entirely successful because of their war aims. And that's something which we're gonna see for a couple other groups as we go on as well. So um, that's women. Second group, this is arguably the most important group for the Nazis. Hitler himself in terms of his long-term plans definitely sees children as being arguably the most important group in society. There's a range of reasons why that's the case. Um, so for the Nazis therefore believe that they have to try and complete um, or have to gain complete control over children. Um, and so there's two main ways in which they go about doing this. The first the first way is obviously the place where children supposed spend most of their time, that is in the school system. So they obviously, like everything else in German society, massively reshape the school system to make it suit their own aims. And the second thing is um, they merge essentially all of the not all the youth groups that had previously existed in Germany before the Nazis took over, as well as compelling students who not pre or children not previously been, previously been in youth groups, um, into this one big organization, which mentioned in the second video, which is the Hitler Youth. So, what are the aims, like women? What are the aims that they're trying to basically achieve with young people? The first, this is a general aim for both boys and girls, um, is that every single child should be brought up to be completely loyal to Hitler. And we don't mean sort of like a shallow loyalty of, you know, I, I support him. We're talking about a deep personal loyalty where they, they each individually feel um, a deep or, 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 or a great affection um, for Hitler. Um, so unquestionably supporting him. Um, so linked to that, secondly, they would therefore, as a consequence, fully and without question, believe and accept all Nazi ideology and belief. So if you look at older people, obviously, even if you get support amongst not older people, there will still be, to some extent, some policies or areas where they may not to, to fully support the Nazis and just sort of keep quiet. Um, or, you know, perhaps just support them because you know it's in their best interests or whatnot. But for young people, they believe that because they're young and impressionable, you can convince them to fully, without question, accept all Nazi beliefs and ideas. The last aim is unique to boys and girls. So the last aim relates to the future roles which the Nazis want boys and girls to grow up to adopt. So they want boys to be raised as the future soldiers to man the German army, and they want girls to be raised, as we mentioned in the previous um, part, women, to be healthy, fertile mothers. And so the entire Nazi school system and youth and youth group system is designed to achieve these three things. A deep personal love for Hitler, full of, full of unquote and sort of like uncritical acceptance of Nazi beliefs, and also um, acceptance of their future roles in German society or belief in those. Um, 
So you can get a question about what the aims were. Now you can also get questions about, I've seen six markers before where they ask you, why did Hitler believe that young people were important or something like that? Or why did he target young people? There's essentially two, there's two, there's two points here. So the first thing is I mentioned it with women point. Um, so it applies to both of these is that again, Hitler has these grand plans and aims to expand Germany militarily um, and take over neighboring territories. And so obviously you need um, children to grow up to do two things. You have to train these young people to be these strong soldiers in the future. Um, and secondly, these are also the, the children who will in the future breed more, again, young, healthy Aryans to um, go out and colonize them. So the school system is essential to convincing young children to go out to be soldiers and also to, when they come older, breed as much as possible. So it's kind of a similar point that we're mentioning with women. Um, the second thing, that's, that's sort of the, the overall reason why they're so important in terms of the focus. But the second thing is also, um, kind of indirectly because they're much easier to control and to indoctrinate. So I mentioned on the previous couple of points, on the previous couple of slides, that obviously adults do matter, but there is a limit to what you can achieve with people who obviously grow up already and have their own established beliefs and ideas. Um, whereas compared to, um, compared to adults, young people obviously are a blank slate and can be indoctrinated quite easily. So they have no pre-existing beliefs or ideas which you have to sort of remove um, or that are sort of competing for your attention. Um, yeah, essentially, they're blank slates so you can indoctrinate. Um, and not only that, they're also going to live much longer than, than older people. So older people will die at some point, um, and young people will basically live long into the future. So for these two reasons, Hitler prioritizes young people or sees them as a crucial um, element of German society to try and control as much as possible. So... We'll go over the ways in which they try to they try to go about doing this. The first thing I've already mentioned is changes to the school curriculum. So there's two sides to this. Number one, um, removing teachers who and replacing them with more cooperative teachers, and also changing the school curriculum. So teachers had to be controlled quite carefully. So any non-approved teachers were sacked, and all teachers had to swear loyalty to Hitler and also be trained specifically in teaching Nazi ideas. Um, and so teachers essentially always act or actively behave as Nazis. So they would, for example, ensure that kids always carried out Nazi salutes. Um, lessons always started and ended with a Heil Hitler. Um, they kept posters and flags around the classrooms of Nazi, Nazi insignia and things like that. So teachers obviously had to be committed Nazis. Like everything else in German society, um, in terms of you know important, important positions, they had to be loyal Nazis. And then what they're meant to teach is, of course, a fully Nazi curriculum. So they, first of all, introduce brand new explicitly nazi subjects like race studies ideology and eugenics um, eugenics is basically the science of breeding so they're actively teaching things about racial hierarchies how you breed properly how you keep the race pure and things like that um, they also keep traditional subjects but alter them to make them subtly um, indoctrinate people so if you remember from the last video we talked about goebbels as methods of indoctrination um, he's really a big fan of this subtle method where you don't really see what's happening. So the traditional subjects are changed or adapted to subtly include methods of indoctrination. So for example, a maths question in a lesson maybe um, involves some problem solving um, elements which ask people to calculate, for example, how much a disabled person would cost the state every single year or how much the, the entire population of disabled people would cost Germany every single year. So you're subtly kind of teaching kids that, you know, Disabled people are really costly, really expensive. Um, and you'll have that across all subjects, really. The final thing is, obviously we mentioned how boys have to be soldiers, girls have to be healthy to be mothers. So both had to be as fit and strong and healthy as possible. So PE um, and fitness was a big part of the German curriculum in schools. So PE time was doubled and it became a strong focus for both boys and girls. Um, and you also had girls being given domestic science lessons, so taught how to... Um, make a home and things like that, cook, clean, etc. Um, the second method then was, as I say, through the youth groups. So this is where the Hitler Youth comes into it. So before the Nazis took over Germany, most German children were already involved in some kind of youth group. Um, in particular, they went to groups run by the churches. Um, however, as we saw in the previous in the preview before last, the Nazis basically outlawed these various different groups when they come to power, except for the Catholic groups who initially part of this deal with the Nazis for the first couple of years. So all youth groups are outlawed in 1933 and instead they're all merged into the Hitler Youth, so you have to attend the Hitler Youth instead. Um, 
So the Hitler Youth basically has a very a variety of different um fat not factions, um, just sort of like ranks and groups within it. So the Hitler Youth refers to the general group overall, but there's also a range of groups within that. So boys and girls are of course separate. Young boys join a group called the German Young People and they're 10. Then from when they're age 14 to 18, they join the Hitler Youth. So there's there's the general Hitler Youth, which they're all part of, but there's also the boys senior group is also called the Hitler Youth. Um, girls also have their own group, so a separate younger one called the Young Maidens. They join again when they're 10, and from the age of 14, they join the girls' version of the Hitler Youth, which is the um, BDM, the League of German Maidens. So what do they do in these two groups? So the Hitler Youth is primarily a political group, and they basically get taught key ideological points. So swearing to, regularly swearing an oath of loyalty to Hitler, they're taught about you know the evils of Jewish people, the German heroes, or the, the all the different heroes of, from, from Germany's history in the past. Um, they're also crucially a very important detail, regularly told and encouraged to report any disloyal teachers or parents. In the very last video, when we talked about um, the use of the Gestapo and things like that. A really key um, demographic in Germany that was used to basically inform and spy on people were children. Um, and you know, there are accounts of children even turning in their parents, but also you know regularly um, telling or ratting on people, um, various different adults they may hear expressing disloyal beliefs or, or attitudes. So they obviously get, like they had in school, active political indoctrination. Um, they secondly, then this is really the bulk of it, is they get a lot of physical training. So like again the peace the peace situation in schools the Hitler youth are designed to make boys as physically fit as possible so they regularly ran sort of regional and national sports competitions lastly they did a lot of military training so the Hitler youth ultimately um is a method of trying to train boys in basically military skills and they're ready for going to war so they learn things like signaling map reading they do arms training so weapons training um and they also had specialist sections as well that existed within it um and they also had called character training by members of the SA to basically toughen up the boys. Um, the girls, like the boys, also have political activities to indoctrinate them, so um, they go on those. Um, and they also had, like the boys, some physical activities which they had to engage in as well to try and keep them physically healthy. However, unlike the boys, instead of military training, they again get domestic skills training, so they learn how to cook, how to iron, how to make beds, sewing, etc. Again, preparing you to be a housewife. So boys get soldier training in the Hitler Youth, girls get housewife training. They also get slightly more um, indoctrination in terms of um, the science of breeding, and they, so they get taught about racial hygiene. And so, because obviously for a woman, they're technically in charge of the birthing process, or for a in charge of the birthing process, um, they again get sort of trained to keep the race pure, as they say, um, and they're sort, of made, they're sort of indoctrinated and told to ensure that they only marry Aryan men so they can have only Aryan children. So again, both schools and the Hitler Youth are essentially both uh, methods of indoctrinating kids, indoctrinating them during the day and also after school in the evenings. Um, so they spend most of their time at, at a place where they're being indoctrinated by Nazis. Um, so again, like the women, there's some evidence of these policies having successes and there's also evidence of failure here. So um, in terms of an argument for, the first thing which you, you talk about, and I would say if you've got 10 mark about this, it seems like it's, self, like it's not actually proving anything, it's just stating what happened, but you could make an entire point just about how Nazis, the Nazis were able to successfully take over schools and ensure that um, they had totally changed the curriculum. So you could do a point just saying how, yes, it was successful because they took over the schools and changed the curriculum and meant that they were indoctrinating, or well, they were highly effective at indoctrinating kids um, in the school system. When it comes to the Hitler Youth, you can look at membership figures. So Hitler Youth um, membership was very, very high. So by the mid-1930s, or from the mid-1930s onwards, it had quite significant numbers. Um, so you have 5 million members of the Hitler Youth by 1936, and you have 8 million by 1940. So that's a large majority of kids. I think that 8 million number, I think it's around 90 or 95% of children in Germany. So the vast majority are in, are in the Hitler Youth. Um, additionally, if you look at sort of kids' responses to the Hitler Youth, many children genuinely enjoyed being involved in it. Um, even if them, like they were not particularly, not very political, um, or even if the Hitler Youth doesn't spend too much time indoctrinating them politically, um, a lot of the time was spent on things like marches, camping, and hiking trips. So for a lot of children, it's actually quite an enjoyable experience. Um, in particular, if you're a, if you're a poorer child, you would never have had a time, had a chance to spend time away from home. Whereas Hitler Youth took you on these trips, um, and so it generally was quite a fun um, place to be, and it sort of gave quite a lot of kids a sense of belonging as well. Um, in addition to that, um, when children sort of wore their uniforms and marched in the street, people had to again show them respect. So again, it gave children a sense of pride and made them feel quite special.
Um, and so for a lot of kids, that was quite an intoxicating feeling actually. Um, and so yeah, on the one hand, it had some successes. However, again, there's quite a few counter arguments in terms of the extent to which this is successful. The first thing is, is you can pick, unpick the numbers a little bit. So yes, the numbers had become quite significant by the late 1930s. However, those numbers can be quite deceptive. First thing is, of course, the numbers swell because all other organizations had been outlawed. So you had no choice but to join the Hitler Youth. So the numbers don't tell you much about, you could argue, don't tell you much in terms of children being actively engaged or wanting to join the Hitler Youth. Secondly, the numbers really only picked up after 1935 when it became compulsory. Um, so before 1936, um, although the groups, other groups have been banned, Hitler Youth numbers were, um, were still not particularly impressive given the amount of encouragement they were given to join the Hitler Youth. So the numbers can be unpacked a little bit. The second thing is, unlike women, is we can actually point to specific and particular examples of opposition to the Nazis amongst, you, amongst young people. So we've got hard evidence of there being resistance to their ideas. So um, there were, first of all, groups that existed that were not directly organizing political activities against the Nazis, but were clearly resisting the social roles that the Nazis were trying to impose upon them and resented the strict Nazi control placed upon them. And so they sort of defied the official Nazi groups. So we've got two examples of this that are both quite interesting from different sections of society. So you first of all have um, the group called the Edelweiss Pirates. And these are basically sort of more working class children um, so they, and they, they basically go out, hang around in the countryside, they'd sort of sing songs mocking the Nazis, um, they'd often wear American clothes, they'd often as well sometimes beat up or find and beat up Hitler Youth members. Um, and there's probably there probably is some level of political, there is a political element to this, but it's not explicitly political, but clearly they don't want to do what they're told to do, and so they're resisting Nazi control. This next group is not political at all, but again, it's essentially just rich kids who don't like being told what to do, and, and essentially express that by um, doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. So you have a group called the Swing Youth who basically gather in parties or they attend these sort of fancy parties where they get together, they drink, they smoke, they dance to American music um, and again just do a range of things which they're not supposed to be doing and sometimes these events get attended by thousands of people at a time. Now these are particularly sort of like wealthy or middle upper class um, children or young people but again you've got clear evidence of individuals who essentially resented Nazi control and refused to go along with their plans. Later on in the Second World War, so if you had um, a question with more restricted time period, then it'd be a bit careful because this is the Second World War. You start to increasingly get organized political resistance by older students. Um, so the most famous example of this, and essentially older students at university campuses, um, the most famous example of this is the White Rose Group that was led by Hans and Sophie Scholl, uh, who then later on get, cap get captured and executed. Um, but essentially they'd be going around on campuses giving out leaflets and trying to organize political opposition to the Nazis specifically. So again, this failure to issue the aims because there are significant groups of individuals who are actively opposing the Nazis despite the massive risks incurred if they were. So in the case of the Edelweiss Pirates, for example, if they are captured, they will get hung and executed. Um, as I say, with the White Rose, Hans and Sophie Scholl also both get executed as well. So um, the fact that, this ex that people are opposing the Nazis despite the potential risk of punishable, basically death and execution as a punishment, shows that clearly opposition was quite significant. Um, so lastly, I'm just going to go over Nazi economic policies. In the process of doing that, I'll then also talk about um, how that applied to workers, farmers, and also lastly, um, sort of large businesses and shopkeepers as well. So um, the Nazis introduced quite ambitious economic plans um, to again help Hitler to try and achieve his main aims. Um, but also more importantly, um, we mentioned in the last video that the Nazis obviously could not keep control of everybody through terror um, or propaganda. The fundamental, the fundamental way which you could potentially try to keep control of a large number of people is by very simply giving them what they want and keeping them happy. The largest group of people in the country, and therefore the most important group of people in the country, were ordinary workers. And so to maintain their support, despite their propaganda and terror, the most important thing is to deliver on the promises which you've made to them, which is specifically to improve the economy and create jobs. And that's what the Nazis do. Um, the Nazis also set up an economic plan in 1934 that aimed to make Germany um, th well, do three things essentially. So they, they had their three main aims. The first thing was to make Germany self-sufficient. We call this autarky. Um, and the, one of the simple reasons behind this is if Germany eventually goes to war um, and you know trade drops and things like that, you need to have, for example, your own food to, to supply the country, not have to ration too much. Um, and if, if Germany's blockaded again, like the First World War, you're not in too much of a difficult scenario situation. So you don't you're not relying on other countries for trade and for your goods to come in. 
The second thing, of course, as I said, the Nazis want to try and Nazis wish to try and reduce unemployment. And lastly, the Nazis want to try and begin preparing Germany for Warsaw rearmament. So these are the three things the Nazis are trying to achieve over the course of the 1930s. So the most famous of the Nazis' policies and the most effective as well was the creation of public works schemes. Okay. So how do you create jobs for working men? Very simple. You start building things, infrastructure. And to do that, this is using public money. And to do that, you obviously have to hire more individuals. And this ends up giving jobs to a lot of, to a lot, to a lot of previous unemployed men during, who were unemployed during the Great Depression. So you've essentially got state-funded jobs um, to build the railways, the motorways, houses, stadiums, etc. So for example, the big Nuremberg Stadium, the Olympic Stadium, etc., the massive motorway network. Um, this helps to create jobs for millions of men. Um, the second thing, as I already mentioned, so we had the self-sufficiency autarky. So Germany had a, well, the Nazis wanted to have a growing population so they can, you know, they want to breed as many people as possible. And so as a consequence, they had to produce its own food. So what this meant was that German agriculture and agricultural sector um, needed to be improved and also protected to ensure that Germany could be self-sufficient in terms of um, growing of food. Um, lastly, rearmament also helped the economic situation for some people. So obviously, um, rearmament meant that you needed to hire men in the factories to produce weapons as well as uniforms, um, as well as also more skilled jobs. So this wasn't just sort of jobs for less skilled workers, but you also required more skilled jobs for producing things like aircrafts and tanks. Um, so what's the impact of these various different policies and do, put pe do people benefit as a consequence? So um, ordinary working men do definitely have some benefits from Nazi policies. So the first thing, this is the headline figure, is that unemployment, and this is the biggest achievement of Nazi role by, by quite a distance, is that unemployment is reduced significantly under the Nazis. And this is due to the public work schemes and the rearmament plan, which ends up creating millions of jobs. So in 1933, when the Nazis took over, unemployment was at 5 million. By 1939, it was at 0 0.5 million. So they had, a, they had essentially all but wiped out unemployment, which is the single biggest issue for the Depression, which again contributes to why the Nazis are so popular, or as a, not so popular as, as, as such, but face such little opposition. Um, the second thing is the Nazis create this um, scheme called Strength Through Joy, um, which is a essentially a scheme to help um, give workers leisure activities um, outside of work and to essentially increase their standard of living. So they would organize, for example, very simple leisure activities. So it could be things as simple as giving workers cheap cinema tickets to, in some cases, um, quite well, sort of high, high, or on, the other side, on, the other part, on the other side of the spectrum, um, organizing cruise ship holidays, but that's a lot more rare. Um, so not that many workers are actually getting the cruise ship holidays. Um, they also had a scheme called the Beauty of Labor Scheme, which tried to improve conditions in the factory. So obviously the trade unions were banned. However, they did still try to make some improvements in the factories. And so the beauty, the beauty of labor scheme did create, have some improvements, such as the creation of washing facilities in, work, in factories and workplaces, and also the creation of low cost canteens for people to buy their food as well. However, again, like women and like um, children, there are some drawbacks to some of these policies. So the first thing is, again, the numbers. The numbers definitely did go down. However, that 0 0.5 million is quite deceptive. And it's basically um, achieved through some very creative manipulation of the numbers. So women who are, of course, forced to give up their jobs and also Jews um, are excluded, excluded from the unemployment stats. Um, the Nazis also counted part-time work amongst full-time employed as well. Um, and also anybody who's in a concentration camp was removed. So clearly the number of unemployed people is much higher. It's clearly dropped. Um, but manipulating the, the statistics allows them to make it seem better than it actually is. Um, even though obviously for previously unemployed men, um, the situation did improve. The second thing, as I mentioned with, this, with the um, beauty of labor scheme, um, is that although there were some small little improvements, such as, you know, washing facilities, facilities etc., because trade unions had been outlawed, workers had no method of trying to, or they had no means of attempting to improve their conditions. They couldn't, if they, if they were being abused at work or, you know, had, having their wages cut, they could not strike or campaign for better pay or conditions, which again was obviously a negative impact for them. Lastly, um, a lot of these schemes which the Nazis came up with sounded good, on, sounded good in practice and on paper, but in reality didn't actually um, come to fruition or achieve their aims. The most famous example of this is the Volkswagen Beetle car scheme, where essentially um, they created this car, which meant to be more affordable, and they had a um, saving scheme set up so an ordinary family could contribute a certain amount of money from their week, from their um, from their regular salary, 
then save for a scheme to then purchase a car, which would have been at the time a radical revolutionary um, development for workers. There's another part of the world where the average worker can afford a car. However, what people are not aware of is the fact that the Volkswagen scheme never actually fully, like, fully came to fruition because production was halted in 1939 and so no workers actually received that car. And so um, it was a theoretical scheme that was planned to come to fruition but never actually did. So in reality, um, a lot was basically promised but not delivered. Um, next group that's quite important, of course, farmers. So you've got your industrial workers, and then you've also got your farmers. So when we talk about workers, we mean industrial workers. When we mean farmers, we mean well, when we mean agricultural workers, we say farmers as opposed to workers. And so farmers benefited from two main policies, both of which again were beneficial, but at the same time had some drawbacks that mean that ultimately um, they didn't totally benefit. So the first thing is the Nazis set up something called the Reich Food Estate, or the sorry, sorry, the Reich Food Estate set up agricultural boards that would buy food from farmers and then distribute it across Germany. And the farmers were basically guaranteed markets at a guaranteed price as a consequence. So you're not having to worry about if, you know, if I am I going to sell my um, food um, that I grow or am I going to potentially get undercut or, you know, have to sell at a particular price. They were guaranteed to sell their food and they were guaranteed a particular fixed price. So you could plan ahead quite effectively. Um, which obviously was beneficial. Um, the second policy is that banks were forbidden from seizing land from farmers that could not repay their mortgage, which is obviously a benefit. However, this has an unintended drawback, which is the fact that far, um, banks are therefore less reluctant to lend to farmers because they know there's a greater risk incurred. So if they think there's a, there's a potential chance that a farmer who they're lending to may not be able to repay that mortgage, then banks would not lend to them. Um, something which you see even today with the current sort of mortgage system of banks as well. So obviously it has a knock on it has a negative knock on effect on them. Um this other kind of point, and this is not so much that farmers do poorly, but it's a fact that Nazi agricultural policy doesn't fully succeed, um, is the fact that a lot of farmers, despite the improvements of policies that the Nazis introduced, um, still choose to leave their land because there's better pay in the factories and the cities. So despite the Nazis' attempts to um despite the Nazis' autarky policy, you still get rural depopulation as people go to the cities and abandon the countryside. So again, it's not a complete success for the Nazis in terms of their policies. Last group in terms of their economic policies are businesses. So um, Hitler promises to protect small businesses and middle and the middle classes. However, despite that being a, cr a, cr a crucial part of his um, campaign pledge in 1933 or campaign pledge in 1933, it's largely big businesses who benefit from Nazi rule. So there's a couple of reasons for this. The first thing is, again, back to the trade unions, the trade unions being banned obviously significantly helps large businesses because they no longer have to worry about striking workers or have to worry about, you know, potentially very negative consequences if they, you know, mistreat their workers or um, come up with controversial policies. Um, the second thing is the policies of rearmament and also public work schemes significantly benefit big businesses because they get these massive government contracts to carry out that labor. So when it comes to manufacturing weapons, chemicals, later on controversially, of course, in the concentration camps, um, creating vehicles, etc. Those have to be built by somebody. And those tend, those are, of course, all the big um, industrialists. So they, they basically benefit quite significantly. So despite the, the Nazis being the party of the workers, traditionally, and again, despite them trying to help the workers in the 1930s, the 1930s continued this trend that started in the 20s. If you remember from the second video that I did, and we discussed the shift from the shift away from socialism, it continues this trend of Hitler moving closer to richer, upper-class members of society and him benefiting them the most as opposed to the workers who he claimed to be trying to help benefit. Um, so those are basically all the groups in Nazi society. So I'll kind of go back to what I was mentioning at the start of the video, which is you can get a 10 or 40 mark question on Nazi methods of control, and they can basically ask you about one of the issues mentioned in relation to the lives of groups of people in Germany. Okay, so you can, in a question about Nazi control, you can talk about terror and propaganda, terror and propaganda but you can also talk about, as reasons for Nazi um, success in, control, in controlling Germany, you can talk about improvements to people's lives, so that's in particular workers, but you can also mention women as well, to some extent, um, and you can also talk about Nazi youth policy, again, as a, method of, uh, as a means of the Nazis keeping control, so bear that in mind, um, that those are things you can potentially talk about if the question leaves it open in terms of the counter arguments and definitely if you're doing paper four on the faulty markers that's a crucial area which you can talk about so um final part of the 
30 part of this topic is looking at minorities. So you can get a wide range of questions that ask you about Nazi perks, persecution of minorities. And there's essentially two kinds of things you, they'll ask you about. Either A, what actually happens to them in terms of four markers, or B, you can get six or 10 mark questions about the reasons or the main reasons why the Nazis persecuted minorities, okay? So I'm looking at this quite straightforward and simple. As opposed to going through every single group exactly why they did it, what you need to understand is the Nazis, broadly speaking, have two reasons for trying to, or for um, persecuting minorities, okay? Um, and so each of these groups will, will, will tick one or both of these boxes. The first reason is what we call the master race theory. Okay, so we've touched on it a little bit already over the course of the last few videos, but essentially Hitler believed that all of Germany, um, or all Germans, were based um, on a physically, intellectually, and culturally superior master race, what he calls the Aryan race. Um, and so this has a few knock-on effects. The first thing is that the Aryan race had to be kept pure and therefore had to be kept separate from other races who he believed may dilute their blood. This therefore leads, as a consequence, to persecution of Jews, Gypsies, Slavs, and also the disabled. The second broad reason is what we call the efficiency requirement. So the Nazis believed that everybody in society had to contribute or work towards common goals and contribute to the nation's prosperity, okay? So essentially, anybody who, for whatever reason, could be considered to be not contributing to German society or could be argued or could be seen to be, have been a drain on German society or resources um, were therefore considered to be undesirables. So this therefore leads to the persecution of gypsies. This is because they often did not work or pay taxes and also by their nature of their sort of their culture and their society, gypsies roamed around and basically stayed, moved from place to place. And so again, they did not contribute to society in the way which the Nazis would have preferred. This also, most famously, is why the disabled get persecuted. So the disabled could not work because the disabled obviously, not only that, the disabled also required quite significant resources to care for them. So for the Nazis, the disabled are the primary example of a group who were a significant drain on the state resources and therefore um, they were persecuted quite terribly. Lastly, homosexuals were also of course persecuted um, very simply because, and there's a broader point about them sort of being morally degenerate from the Nazis' perspective, but the more simple and straightforward reason is that they did not obviously procreate or well, technically would not be um, procreating and so they're not contributing to the expansion of the Aryan race and so again were therefore victims of persecution. So what do they actually do in terms of persecuting different groups in German society? So when it comes to Jewish people there's three stages of this. The first stage is economic, is economic persecution. The first two years of Nazi rule and um, the Nazis are targeting Jews economically so they basically order a boycott of Jewish shops and businesses and they also ban Jews from a range of jobs, in particular any government jobs. So they make it financially much more difficult for Jews to, le to lead um, successful lives in Germany. From 1935 onwards, economic persecution then turns and develops into political persecution. So the Nuremberg Laws are passed in 1935, and this effectively strips Jews of all citizenship rights, and it also forbids any sexual relations between Jews and Germans, because the two things are now considered to be distinct and separate. And then from 1938 onwards, Jews have to carry ID cards to make it even easier to identify them. So they're basically removed from German society and forcibly kind of segregated. In 1938 onwards, you then start to get the rise of physical persecution. So for 1938, there is no active attempt to physically persecute or um, harm Jews. However, the Kristallnacht pogroms in 1938 are the beginning of this. So Kristallnacht, very simply, is a pogrom that is triggered by the shooting of a German diplomat in Paris um, by a Polish Jew whose parents had been um, deported from Germany following um, some new policies in the 1930s. He's, of course, quite upset and distraught by this. And so, essentially, as a sort of a, a, an act of revenge, goes into the, the, the German embassy in Paris and shoots him. This then gives the Nazis a pretext and the perfect excuse to trigger and encourage violent pogroms um, against Jews across Germany. So, you have SA members posing as ordinary German citizens who start to randomly attack Jewish businesses, synagogues, and homes across Germany over, a, over two days of rioting on the 9th and 10th of November. In the process of this um, pogrom, over 100 Jews are killed. Jews are then, this is the real kind of kicker in terms of Kristallnacht, are then fined 1 billion marks to pay for the damage that was caused by rioting against them during Kristallnacht. And then the final part of this episode is they then round up 20,000 Jewish men who are then sent to concentration camps on the 12th of November. 
Um, and so as a consequence of Kristallnacht and also previous measures taken against them, by um, the start of the Second World War, 40% of German Jews had left Germany as a consequence. Um, I'll just briefly go through what happened to other groups because you can also get questions about them. So for gypsies, you kind of regularly get arrests of gypsies across Germany and they're also regularly sent to concentration camps throughout the 1930s. They also have the same rules on marriage and citizenship as Jews have, so they're also encountered by the Nuremberg laws. And lastly, in 1938, all gypsies are placed on a register that tries to keep track of them across the country. Um, the sale policy is, of course, also highly controversial. So in 1933, you have a compulsory sterilization program of anyone who is mentally ill, deformed, deaf, or blind. And so as a consequence, you get 400,000 surgical operations carried out to sterilize people forcibly against their will by 1939. The most controversial and terrible um, event, however, is the creation of the T4 program, which is basically a euthanasia program against um, mentally or physically disabled um, children, either by starvation or uh, lethal injection. And so you have 5,000 children being killed as a consequence of the T4 program, and you also have 72,000 mentally um, ill Germans being gassed in um, the concentration camps between 1930, between, um, sorry, between 1939 and 1941. However, and this goes back to the previous video that I mentioned about um, the churches, so quick, just add this to your notes from that. You can actually use this as an example of opposition to the Nazis being somewhat successful amongst the churches. So the churches are opposed to this, and there is a massive public outcry, and it's the only real example of the Nazis backing down from a policy as a consequence of public outcry and opposition to a particular policy. So it ends in 41 due to that, but not before killing tens of thousands of people. Lastly, in terms of homosexuals, that was obvious, of course, or that was already a crime in Germany before the Nazis took over. However, the Nazis strengthened laws against them, leading to 50,000 arrests um, in the 1930s and 10,000 ending up in concentration camps specifically. Um, the Nazis also create laws that encourage voluntary castration as well. So you can potentially get formal questions that ask you about methods of persecution or what that actually included. So what well, I'm just going to finish off with very briefly, um, but before I do that, I'm just going to talk briefly about this, this topic, is I'm going to go over the impact of the Second World War. Now, there are a range of four and six mark questions you can get about the Second World War that I think are largely okay in terms of answering. You can also get 10 mark questions. This is like a cop-out, or this is a cop-out essentially, but my personal opinion is if you were to get a 10 mark question on the Second World War, then I'd basically avoid answering that set of ABC questions and choose whatever is, whatever is the alternative because it's just going to be quite tricky. Um, and they could they could ask in theory anything and they're all just quite difficult questions to answer. So I'll kind of just run through the topic briefly, assuming that it would be enough for a four or six mark question, but not, I'm not going to go into it in, in loads and loads of detail. But basically, um, the impact of the war initially isn't so significant because the war goes well for Germany at the start. So in the first couple of years of the war, there's very minimal impact outside of food rationing, which was introduced immediately after the war began in 1939. Um, there's also quite a lot of propaganda efforts to try and keep support for the war very high, and the Gestapo do monitor dissent very, very closely. Um, as I said, in the first couple of years of the war, Germany is on the front, for, front foot and is capturing territory, and so luxury goods are flowing into Germany from captured territories like France, and so most people are still relatively happy. However, Things take a turn for the worse after 1941 when Hitler and the, and the Nazis invade the USSR. Um, this ends up being a massively expensive war, both in terms of death toll, but also in terms of um, resources that get expanded, that get expended in, in the war. And for the next three years, as more and more resources get put, get pushed um, and pulled into the failed and really doomed effort in the Soviet Union, um, you start to get even further shortages of goods. You get less fuel for heating. You also start to get in terms of living conditions for you know ordinary people. Um, longer working hours in the factories, as well as, again, linked to that previous point that I mentioned in the women's section about um, undermining their own policies, you get even more, more women being drawn to work in the factories um, because they need more workers to go in there. Um, and so as a consequence, in the 1940s, you get the entire economy being directed entirely towards the war and all resources are getting poured into the war effort. Um, that also means that all entertainment places are closed with the exception of cinemas, which the Nazis keep open because it's a way of showing propaganda films, as I mentioned in the last video, that can obviously help to kind of try and maintain greater support for the war. Um, but it's quite clear that during the Second World War, support for the government and the regime has clearly declined. You have far fewer public displays of support from the, from the civilians. So, for example, flags being hung up on houses and things like that, as well as rally attendances drop 
salutes in the street, etc. So public support for the Nazis is definitely dropping. But obviously, you're not getting too much opposition because, of course, um, there's still a fear of the Gestapo and the Nazi ex sort of punishments do escalate in the in the 1940s. The other impact of the Second World War, um, in comparison to the First World War, is that the Second World War obviously is a total war that also reaches um, the home front and affects civilians in Germany. So Germany itself becomes a battlefield, um, and German cities become targets of massive bombing raids, and that's both industrial areas or industrial cities and targets, but also civilian targets. So the bombing campaigns of the Allies do try to take out German infrastructure, but also try to bomb civilians to lower morale and again try and forcibly bring about a surrender or an end to the war if possible. The most controversial and famous event here, um, and, this, the, and the culmination of this bombing campaign, is the destruction of Dresden in February 1945, so a few months out from the end of the war, where in the course of two days, the Allies completely destroyed the um, city center of Dresden, and in consequence, kill 150,000 people, um, mostly civilians, basically. In terms of total numbers, by 1945, three million Germans have died um, as a result of the war, and the country is also in a desperate state with many more facing starvation due to the chronic food shortages. Final impact of the world I'm going to go over, um, and this is obviously the most controversial part of the of this entire topic, and of course, um, Nazi rule and the Second World War. So of course, the impact which the war has on Jewish people. So I mentioned when we looked at persecution of minorities, that physical persecution of Jews starts after 1938. This, however, escalates massively when the Second World War breaks out. And I think I have seen six mark questions on why the Holocaust happened or the Final Solution happened. And essentially, it's because of what happens after the Second World War. Initially, there were only half a million Jews under Nazi control, basically within Germany, um, when they first took over. However, when the Nazis start to invade, when they take over Poland at the start of the Second World War and then also invade the Soviet Union, these are the two countries that have by far the largest number of Jews in the world. And so the population of Jewish people under Nazi control swells massively. Um, and so the Nazis start to actively pursue policies to essentially murder them. So initially, um, the Nazis are initially rounding up Jews and force them to live in ghettos that are effectively run as concentration camps. The famous ghettos are the Warsaw Ghetto and Theresienstadt um, in, che in, in che Czechoslovakia um, are effectively concentration camps. Um, and what happens in these ghettos is that people are essentially forced to work as slave or the able are forced to work as slave labor and the elderly are left to die of, of starvation disease the same way which you would get in a regular concentration camp. However, the real controversial um, policies begin in 1941 when the Nazis start to use special SS units called the Einsatzgruppen um, to carry out mass shootings and executions of Jews all over Eastern Europe. So when they go into the Soviet Union and invade Russia, they are sent essentially these mobile death squads to round up Jews in towns and villages and cities, take them out and essentially execute them by f and shoot them essentially outside almost immediately. Initially, there are 800,000 Jews that are murdered this way. And then in 1942, you get what the Nazis call the final solution to the Jewish question, where they meet at a conference or they meet at a place called Wannsee in Germany. Um, and they, they have this conference where they basically meet to discuss and decide what they will, as I said, they call the final solution to the Jewish question. And that's in January 1942. And this is where the decision is made to decide to eliminate all Jews, um, as opposed to simply trying to force them out or segregate them or whatever. And so as a consequence of the final solution, um, you get the construction of purpose-built extermination camps, okay? So different to the older concentration camps that were essentially hard labor camps where you died as a byproduct, these are camps where people are transported to um, systematically and murdered instantly in the case of anybody who's considered to be unfit for work. So that basically means old people, or also the sick, or in some cases, young children as well, who can't be used to work. Anybody who can be used to work are then used as slave labor and worked to death as a, as a, as a consequence, the same way they would in a previous regular concentration camp. And of course, the impact of this is that you have um, around 6 million Jews, um, and as well as that, hundreds of thousands of other persecuted minorities who would either be worked to death, gassed instantly, or shot in these camps. And that's the final impact of the Second World War. Of course, of course it's of course the most controversial um, and most well-known impact, um, and it's directly linked to the nature of what happens in the Second World War. Um, so I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier just to wrap up the video. Um, so they are still uncommon as questions, um, and they tend to be four-mark questions, rarely six or tens. As I mentioned beforehand, my view would be that if they ask a ten-mark question on it, it would be best to avoid that set of questions and just pick whatever else is the alternative. Or even, 
if there's a particularly tricky six mark question because ultimately they can ask anything about it um and i just think the other topics tend to be more straightforward even if they're more tricky questions um so for this topic overall you ideally are going to get a 10 or 40 mark question that simply focuses on the factors or the main factors enabling nazi control um that basically brings that series to an end um i hope that was useful i tried to make it as comprehensive as i possibly could if you have any questions either about the content that i covered or anything about specific questions which you've seen that you got yeah, if you want questions about how to plan it or have your own suggestion of points feel free to leave it in the comments section below um, and I'll respond to it whenever I see it, whenever I get a chance. Um, and good luck with your upcoming exams.